In this lesson, we are going to discuss Cartesian products. Suppose that we have two sets S and T. The Cartesian product of these sets is the new set S cross T. And the elements are ordered pairs such that the first entry comes from S and the second entry comes from T. We will often refer to S cross T just as the product of S and T. We can also form the Cartesian product of more than two sets. Suppose that we have here n sets, the Cartesian product of the sets a1, a2, up to a sub n will be the n tuples, wherein the first entry will come from the first set, second entry comes from the second set, and so on. The ith coordinate of the n tuple, a sub 1, a sub 2, up to a sub n, is a sub i. We say that the two n tuples are equal if and only if the entries are equal component wise. Here is an example. Suppose that A is a set containing 1, 4, and B is a set of all x in Z such that x squared is equal to 4. Our B will just be the set 2, negative 2, and therefore A cross B we will form the set of all possible ordered pairs. So we have these are the elements of A cross B. For our B cross A, we are starting with elements from B. So we have we can also form a cross B cross A and the elements would be the elements of the set would be this eight ordered triples. Notice here that A cross B and B cross A are not the same. That is because the Cartesian product is not commutative. What can we say about the cardinality of two finite sets? Suppose that A and B are finite sets with A having M elements and B having N elements. Then the cardinality of the product A cross B is just equal to MN or this is just the same as the product of their cardinalities. The proof of this one just follows directly from the fundamental principle of counting. You have M choices for the first entry and you have N choices for the second entry. The Cartesian product of sets are not just confined to finite sets. We can also form the Cartesian product of sets involving infinite sets. For example, our A is a set of natural numbers and B is the set containing 0, 1. What are the elements of A cross B? A cross B would have infinitely many elements. For the first element, we have 1, 0, 1, 1. Then 2, 0, 2, 1, and so on and so forth. How will the graph of A cross B look like? We have 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, and so on and so forth. And this one will just continue indefinitely. Here's another example. Suppose that A is the closed interval 1, 2, and B is the closed interval 3, 4. What are the elements of A cross B? The elements of AB would be the set of all ordered pairs X, Y, such that X is in A, so therefore it's between 1 and 2, and Y is an element of B, so therefore it's between 3 and 4. So therefore, it's this square region here. The elements inside this square region have x coordinate from 1 to 2 and y coordinate from 3 to 4. You have already encountered the set R2, 
that is just the Cartesian product of the set of real numbers with itself. And the elements are, of course, ordered pairs x, y, where x and y are just real numbers. What are the elements of the set 1, 2, 3 cross the empty set? The answer here is the empty set as well. Why is that so? Suppose that this set is not empty. When a set is not empty, then it means that it has an element. What would be an element of this set? Since this is a Cartesian product, the element is of this form. It's an ordered pair, where A is an element of 1, 2, 3, and B is an element of the empty set. But can this even happen? No, because the empty set cannot have an element. So therefore, this set must be empty. Now, in general, the product of two sets is the empty set if and only if at least one of them is empty. Take note that this is a biconditional. Hence, we need to prove two directions. What is our standard technique in showing that a set is empty? We always use its negation, right? Now, in this case, we are proving a statement of the form P if and only if Q. And recall that P if and only if Q is equivalent to P implies Q and Q implies However, P implies Q is equivalent to its contrapositive. Not Q implies not P and Q implies P is the same as not P implies not Q. So therefore, when you combine this, not Q implies not P and not P implies not Q, this is just a statement not P if and only if not Q. So therefore, we have found that P implies Q is equivalent to this one. You can get the negation of each component and form the biconditional. And that follows from the fact that an implication is equivalent to its contrapositive. So therefore, we will attack the problem by solving the equivalent statement. So the equivalent statement would be, the negation of this, so that's A cross B, is not empty if and only if, what is the negation of an OR statement? It will be end. A is not empty or becomes end. And B is not empty. So for the proof, of course, we start with sets A and B. For this direction, meaning to say I am proving A cross B implies this two. So we start with our assumption that A cross B is not empty. If A cross B is not empty, then we know that it has an element. And what would be an element of A cross B? It will be an ordered pair, right? So hence, there exists... A in A and B in B such that AB is an element of A cross B. Let us recall from our previous discussions that if we know that a set S is not empty, then there exists an X element of S. Take note that I am no longer using X here. Because an element of A cross B would be an ordered pair. So I will no longer say there exists an X element of A cross B. Of course, you can still do this. X is an element of A cross B. But what does it mean for X to be in A, B? It means that X has to be an ordered pair. So you will still end up with X equals A, B for some element A in capital A and B in B. The reason why I did not want to do this is because I want to minimize the use of variables here. 
there's no use of x actually because x is just equal to a, B. Going back to the proof, what can we observe here? There exist A in A and B in B. And therefore, we have seen here that A is not empty and the set B is also not empty. For the other direction, that would be an exercise. Here is another example given four sets A, B, C, D. If A is a subset of C and B is a subset of D, then A cross B would be a subset of C cross D. For our proof, we are proving an implication. This is our premise and this is our conclusion. So therefore, we start with our premise, but of course, we have to write down our hypothesis. We now suppose our premise, A is a subset of C and B is a subset of D. How do we show subset relationship? We get an arbitrary element here and show that it is an element of the second set. What will an arbitrary element of A cross B look like? It is an ordered pair. So we let A B be an arbitrary element of A cross B. Of course, when I say that A, B is an element of A cross B, it automatically means that A is in A and B is in B. Since A is an element of A and A is a subset of C and our B is in B and our set B is a subset of D, we have that a is in C and B is in D. So thus, the ordered pair AB is now an element of C cross D. That proves that A cross B is a subset of C cross D. Here are the results on Cartesian product. Suppose that we have four sets a, B, C, and D, the following hold. First, the Cartesian product of a set and the union of sets is just equal to the union of the Cartesian product. So this is saying that you can distribute product over set union. So that's why you have A cross B union A cross C. Similarly, you can distribute Cartesian product over intersection. The third one is saying that the cross product of any set and the empty set will always yield the empty set. The fourth and fifth statements are saying that the intersection of two Cartesian products is just equal to the Cartesian product of the intersections. So what happens is that first you get the intersection of the first sets and then you get the intersection of the two sets. That is also true if you replace intersection with union. Let us prove part one. We are showing equality of two sets. So therefore, we will prove this direction first. So that is, we will show that this is a subset of this set. So to show that this is a subset of the set, we get an arbitrary element here. This is just a Cartesian product. So therefore, it is an ordered pair. Let me call it AD. I'm using D here because D is an element of B union C. I don't want to use B or C. So AD here is an element of A cross B union C. That is how an arbitrary element of A cross B union C look like. Hence, A is in capital A and D is an element of B union C. We want to show that this ordered pair is an element of A cross B or A cross C. Since D is an element of B union C, D is an element of B or D is an element of C. Take note that we have or. 
if we have a given which involves an or, that means that we can proceed by cases. So for our first case, D is in B. If D is in B, what do we have? A is in A and D is in B. So therefore, AD is an element of A cross B. For our second case, suppose that D is in C, then A cross D is an element of A cross C. So therefore, we obtained two conclusions. For case 1, AD is in A cross D. For case 2, AD is an element of A cross C. What can we conclude from here? Therefore, it's either AD is in A cross D or... So that's union A cross C. Hence, this subset relationship is true. For the other direction, we prove this subset relationship. So first, we get an arbitrary element of A cross B union A cross C. What will be an arbitrary element of this set? It will still be an ordered pair. I will call it AD. So take note my use of A and D here is already different from my variable A and D in the previous slide because this is already another part of the proof. So there will be no confusion. Since we have union here, this means that this is in A cross B or this is in A cross C. So just like what we did with the previous direction, we again divide this into two cases. So for our first case, we have AD is an element of A cross B. If AD is an element of A cross B, then D is an element of B. I only consider D. Why is that? I want to show that our arbitrary element AD is an element of A cross B union C. So that means I just want to end up with D being in B union C. We already know that small a is in capital A. Similarly, when AD is an element of A cross C, it means that D is an element of C. So thus, we have shown that AD is an element of A cross our D is an element either of B or C. So that's B union C. It only means that this set is a subset of the first set. Combining the two subset relationships that we have shown, these two sets must be equal.